What does a 40,000-year-old boomerang tell us about the first Cro-Magnons? Let's find out. Boomerangs are most famously associated with Aboriginal Australians, where they served not just as hunting weapons, but also as tools of ceremony and storytelling. Yet occasional finds of boomerangs have cropped up in unexpected places, from Europe to Egypt to the Americas. The 40,000-year-old Polish specimen is one of the oldest known weapons of its type in Eurasia. Carved from mammoth ivory, the artifact is curved and aerodynamic, bearing a striking resemblance to a returning boomerang. According to the study report, this study refines the chronology of the early Upper Paleolithic occupation of Layer 8 at Oblazoa Cave, through radiocarbon dating of several bones and the human fossil found near the ivory boomerang. Bayesian modelling places the site's main occupation phase between 42,800 and 10 to 38,550 years ago, with a 95.4% probability. The mammoth ivory boomerang, calibrated to 42,290 to 39,280 years ago, also with a 95.4% probability, emerges as one of Europe's oldest known examples of this complex tool, exemplifying technological and symbolic innovation at Oblazawa Cave. The boomerang's age puts it squarely in the time range of the earliest modern humans to inhabit Europe, contemporaries if not members of the so-called Cro-Magnon group. If these humans were making boomerangs 40,000 years ago, then clearly these were cognitively and technically sophisticated people. Large boomerangs like this would have been used to break the legs of deer or even larger animals such as elk, just as they are used to hunt kangaroos in Australia. In fact, they are a much more effective hunting tool in many cases compared to projectile weapons such as the bow and arrow or spear thrower. The term Cro-Magnon remains a valid and scientifically useful designation because it refers specifically to a population of early modern humans in Ice Age Europe whose skeletal remains exhibit robust features that distinguish them from both Neanderthals and later Homo sapiens populations. The decision by some anthropologists to abandon the term was rooted in an outdated belief in the strict replacement model that modern humans were an entirely separate species that did not interbreed with Neanderthals. This view has since been overturned by overwhelming genetic evidence showing that interbreeding did occur. By discarding the term Cro-Magnon, researchers erased a critical label for the distinctive early European Upper Paleolithic population that helps us trace the hybridization and diversification of modern humans. Reinstating the term acknowledges both the historical significance of these fossils and the complex evolutionary tapestry that shaped modern human ancestry, rather than using word salad terminology. The age coincided with the emergence of the initial Upper Paleolithic industry and the word salad Lincombian Ranesian Jurs Manowitzian techno complex in Germany. Humans associated with the Lincombian Ranesian Jurs Manowitzian culture were present in Central and Northwestern Europe long before the extinction of Neanderthals 40,000 years ago. According to a report in Sci News, Scientists sequenced and analyzed the genomes of seven individuals who lived between 42,000 and 49,000 years ago in Ranis, Germany, and Zlaty Kuhn in the Czech Republic. The results show that distant familial relationships link the Ranis and Zlaty Kuhn individuals and that they were part of the same small, isolated population that represents the deepest known split from the early Eurasian lineage, the report concluded. The discovery of the 40,000-year-old boomerang in Poland is not just a quirky artifact from deep time, but a doorway into a far more profound and challenging question. Could the first Europeans and the first Australians share a common ancestry deeper than we once imagined? This question has moved from the fringes of speculation toward the centre of paleoanthropological inquiry, thanks to decades of meticulous skull measurements by the physical anthropologist William Howells, and the surprising morphological patterns he unearthed. Howells, who began recording human cranial measurements in the 1970s, amassed data from tens of thousands of skulls in museum collections across the world. His objective was to use these anatomical datasets to explore biological relationships between human populations 
and to reconstruct broad-scale population history. These craniometric studies, unlike the more recent genomic approaches, relied on measurable features of skulls, brow ridges, cranial vault dimensions, dental arches, and more. What made Howell's work especially enduring was its rigorous statistical methodology and the openness of his data, which enabled other researchers to test and refine his conclusions long after the original work had been completed. Among the most provocative findings to emerge from Howells's cranial datasets was the statistical closeness between Ice Age Europeans, specifically the so-called Cro-Magnon people, and modern Aboriginal Australians and Papuans. In a 1989 expansion of his earlier studies, Howells included a number of fossil skulls in his global comparisons. He was not merely trying to determine which group looked like which. He was probing whether underlying anatomical patterns could reflect deep genealogical links, remnants of population movements dating back to the earliest dispersals of Homo sapiens out of Africa. But it is not only skulls that have provoked interesting theories. In 2017, Russian anthropologist Dr. Maria Mednikova published a fascinating study examining the finger bones of early Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. Her analysis of the distal phalanx, the last bone in the pinky, suggested its traits may derive from tropical modern humans through an ancient introgression event. In other words, some of these robust traits might represent a shared legacy from early tropical Homo sapiens, who used their hands intensively for tool use. One, Cro-Magnon, Kostenki-14, whose hand bones, along with those of the Neanderthals, suggest that the overlap may not be coincidental. According to Mednikova, the exceptionally robust phalanges of the Altai Neanderthals might have derived from early tropical Homo sapiens. So why does the Polish boomerang matter in this conversation? Because cultural tools often accompany and reflect population movement. The manufacture of a boomerang, particularly a returning one, is no easy feat. It requires not only a grasp of mechanical properties and aerodynamics, but also repeated trial and error, within a tradition of knowledge. Boomerangs don't occur randomly. They emerge from shared understanding and skilled craftsmanship, passed from hand to hand, generation to generation. Could such traditions have roots in an ancient shared ancestry between the ancestors of Aboriginal Australians and the first Europeans? Howell's craniometric studies included a number of upper Paleolithic European skulls, such as those from Cro-Magnon, and other sites like Predmosti, Sunghir, and Dolni Vestonice. Surprisingly, when plotted against modern human populations, many of these ancient European skulls clustered not with modern Europeans, but with populations from Sahul, the ancient landmass comprising Australia, New Guinea, and Tasmania before sea levels rose. This was not merely a visual similarity, but a statistical affinity in terms of skull shape, size, and other features. The implication was startling. Either these Ice Age Europeans and ancient Australians shared a common ancestral population not reflected in modern Europeans, or convergent evolution had caused these groups to evolve similar skull forms, despite geographic and genetic separation. But the convergence hypothesis seems unlikely. Aboriginal Australians and Papuans are some of the most genetically and morphologically distinct populations in the world. Their ancestors appear to have reached Sahul more than 50,000 years ago based on archaeological sites such as Majed Bebe in northern Australia and Nia Cave in Borneo. If the Cro-Magnon people, arriving in Europe around 45,000 years ago, shared ancestral ties with them, the divergence had to occur before both groups radiated outward from a common node. In China, another 40,000-year-old human was unearthed. Tianyuan Man exhibits a unique genetic affinity for a fossil known as Goyet Q, 116-1 from the Goyet Caves in Belgium. In fact, Goyet Q, 116-1, shares more alleles with Tianyuan Man than does any other sampled ancient individual from West Eurasia. The Goyet Q, 116-1 specimen is inferred to have received 20% ancestry from a population distantly related to that one which also contributed to the Tianyuan man. So the earliest Chinese and the earliest Europeans were related and descended from the same population as Aboriginal Australians. In an interesting twist, 
Ancient DNA shows ancient Europeans are more closely related to Aboriginal Australians than to Africans. This leads to the broader debate between replacement and assimilation in human origins. The strict out-of-Africa model posited that all modern humans radiated out of a single African origin around 60,000 years ago and replaced existing archaic populations like Neanderthals. But this view has softened into more complex scenarios involving gene flow, introgression, and overlapping waves of dispersal. Under an assimilation model, early modern humans moved outward from Africa and interbred with local archaic populations like Neanderthals in Europe and Denisovans in Asia. These early dispersers before being swamped by later waves may have retained more archaic features, and perhaps it was these groups that gave rise to both the Cro-Magnon and the ancestors of modern Australians. Genetic studies have partially supported this. Aboriginal Australians carry low but significant levels of Denisovan ancestry, suggesting a route through Southeast Asia. Ancient DNA from Upper Paleolithic Europeans also shows Neanderthal admixture. But what if a deeper connection lies in a population that once spread across the Indian subcontinent, Southeast Asia, and Southern Eurasia, only to be later overwritten in Europe by newer populations from the East? This idea finds support in fossil skulls, like those from Sri Lanka and Central China, which display some morphological similarities to both early Australians and Cro-Magnon Europeans. Furthermore, the skulls from Lake Mungo in Australia some of the oldest human remains on the continent, share features with ancient Europeans rather than with modern East Asians. In particular, the tall cranial vaults and pronounced brow ridges in Mungo Man resemble Upper Paleolithic European skulls more than they do the skulls of modern Chinese or Polynesians. Perhaps the most plausible explanation for this pattern is that there once existed a widespread population of early modern humans across southern Eurasia from the Levant and Arabia to India, Southeast Asia, and parts of Europe. This population carrying some archaic features but anatomically modern in form and behavior was the common ancestor of both the Cro-Magnon and the Sahul peoples. In this model, the ancestors of Australians and Papuans moved rapidly along the southern coastal route, while other branches remained in western and central Eurasia, giving rise to the Ice Age European populations. Over time, the European branch was replaced or absorbed by later populations migrating in from Central Asia and the Near East, giving rise to the modern European population structure. This would explain why Cro-Magnon skulls appear more Australo-Melanesian in their metrics, while modern Europeans and East Asians appear more gracile and derived. It also fits with the DNA evidence. Modern Europeans carry only a fraction of the ancestry that Cro-Magnon people had. Some studies suggest that less than 10% of the genome of modern Europeans can be traced directly to the early Upper Paleolithic inhabitants of Europe. Returning to the boomerang, we are left with an intriguing possibility. If both the earliest Australians and Europeans made these tools, not just as weapons but as cultural objects, it may reflect not just a shared ancestry but a shared cognition, a way of thinking, of manipulating the environment, of understanding motion, aerodynamics and rhythm. The boomerang in Poland could be a vestige of that cognitive legacy, a sign that before populations fragmented and adapted to vastly different environments, they shared a cultural vocabulary as well as a biological one. Moreover, this connection is not only morphological or technological, it is spiritual. Boomerangs in Australia are tied to dreamtime stories, to rituals, to the very act of storytelling. If a similar cognitive pattern existed in Europe 40,000 years ago, we may be looking at the earliest roots of myth, belief, and symbolic behavior, perhaps even music and art. And indeed, alongside the Polish boomerang, there are bone flutes from the same time period in Germany, red ochre burials in Russia, and Venus figurines from Central Europe. All these may represent a cultural sphere far broader than we previously thought, one stretching across Eurasia from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Lastly, in France, new evidence suggests that bows and arrows were used by early modern humans in Europe 54,000 years ago and has strengthened the idea that such projectile technology might have given early modern humans an edge over Neanderthals.
The combination of the bow and arrow, along with boomerangs this early in Europe, suggests that the first modern humans in Europe were more sophisticated than previously believed and much more deadly. So, while the statistical similarity of Cro-Magnon skulls to Aboriginal Australians and Papuans, as recorded by William Howells, does not prove common origin, it strongly suggests it. The 40,000-year-old boomerang found in Poland is not just a random artifact, but could be part of a larger story about the deep connections between early human populations across continents. While the genetic and fossil evidence is still being pieced together, one thing is increasingly clear. The early story of modern humans in Eurasia was not one of tidy migrations and clean splits. It was a messy, complex web of movements, interbreeding, isolation and innovation. The first Australians and the first Europeans may indeed have sprung from the same ancient root, a population whose echoes still reverberate in our bones, in our tools, and in the curved flight of a boomerang.